Welcome to the Mirror Talks podcast, where we deconstruct some of humanity's most disconnecting and limiting assumptions and offer an alternative, a free state of consciousness, unbiased, naturally wise, and genuinely loving. We will shed a more enlightened perspective on everyday experiences to help anyone willing realize their true potential and inspire a contemporary spiritual life lift in service to all. Say goodbye to the man-made paradigms of distorted ideas. Let's become pure, free, and actually intelligent once again. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. This episode, The Courage of Authenticity, is one of, if not my favorite episode this season. It does start a little slow, just FYI, because as usual, we don't come with any predetermined topic, but don't let the slow start fool you. This episode sets an epic bar, actually multiple epic bars, for straight up authenticity and service to others in a way that I have never seen that bar set. So you'll see Bentinho throughout this episode shine a light on all kinds of fake authenticity traps that people fall into. And he implores leaders of all kinds to share the load by stepping into real authenticity and real service to others, regardless of the backlash. So it will be hard to watch this episode, especially as a leader, and not become embarrassingly self-aware of your bullshit. So be forewarned. The bar setting doesn't stop there, though. We also get into how easily offended people are today and how and why it's so important to see beneath the surface instead of hiding in a world of labels like we tend to do. And finally, and maybe most importantly, late in the episode, Bentinho shares a message starting with, if I die today, forget my teachings, but remember this one thing. So as usual, I can't wait to share this one with you all. Enjoy the episode. Is there any topic you feel a particular pull towards tonight? I felt a little bit the topic of authenticity and um, the nature of paradox and confusion, which in uh, certain Buddhist stories are said to kind of be the gatekeepers of enlightenment, like confusion and paradox. And um, the, like, just what is real authenticity? And um, Mm. just like, because we see so many people in those uh, spiritual communities act authentic, but Mm -hmm. lack authenticity. Mm. Yes. And it's kind of painful to watch. Um. I mean, it is what it is, but so that kind of came up like addressing, um, I don't know if I want to use this actually as podcast, but it was a topic that was on my mind a little bit this, in yeah. terms of like, for example, my appearances or that people are scared away by someone that wears a suit, smokes a cigar or makes a statement or uses a cuss word or and then this whole niche audience or group of teachers that is really catering to staying safe socially and staying within the socially accepted norms in their expressions and their ways of expressing them. It just kind of feels like it's lacking some rebellion. It's lacking some authenticity. It's lacking there for some truth. And how easy it would be for me to, and has been, if I wanted to, if I would have wanted to throughout my 10 years or so of teaching, I've had many choice points where I knew if I'm going to express myself in this manner, in manner A, um, I'm going to be liked, I'm going to be loved, it's going to be easily digestible for everybody. They're going to go like, oh, that's so good. Um, Or I knew I could express Mm -hmm. myself as in way, way B, like the other alternative way. And actually, Um, not always, sometimes I have chosen a if I felt like that authentically had the most benefit and carried that particular particular message better. 
so that the form and the symbol, the demonstration of what the content was that wanted to come through, was actually matched by being easy to digest, being friendly, being uh, on the surface level, also kind and also, um, yeah, digestible, I suppose, so that it would not require people to look as much beyond the surface and to see as much into the paradox and to see beyond the taboos and the labels and the words of their own thoughts. And sometimes that's the best way to uh, deliver a certain message. But sometimes occasionally, it's just that those occasional moments, they'll be drawn out, they'll gather a lot of attention, and they'll gather a lot of uh, kind of what, press or commentary. But so occasionally, I will choose option B, or way of expressing myself, or wh way of carrying the message, giving it a form, a shape, uh, uh, words, and all that, and that will trigger some people. But somehow I feel that the demonstration or the method in which it is shared, actually carries the intended message, the actual authentic intended message, with much greater authenticity and precision. Um, and I just have been kind of like, as I have gauged and sort of scanned the you know, spiritual communities and teachings and teachers and all that, at least in modern day and age, I've kind of felt like, come on, guys, like, let's up the ante on our authenticity and not just play authentic and like, sound authentic and, and make ourselves as, especially as teachers, make ourselves sort of socially safe in the way we express ourselves. And I just find that at, at the root of that often, it's, it's not necessarily always one's true expression which could be the justification for it, or the reasoning behind it. But I think a lot of the times, teachers will cater to that because they either don't want to lose their image or their mm. following, they don't want to be critiqued, or they want to appear a more enlightened. Because that's that typical thing like, um, well, if you if you claim any form of kind of enlightened perspective or consciousness, then you're going to have to express yourself in ways that people expect you to express yourself. And now people will play with that a little bit, but still in very inauthentic ways, I feel, or subtly inauthentic ways where they'll kind of like, maybe they'll even address the fact that, oh, you know, um, enlightenment doesn't have to come in the form of a beard and a mala and a saffron colored robe. Um, it can also just look like this ordinary, simple person that just whatever, but it always caters to it always caters to the weakness in people when it comes to the meaning they've given to words and taboos and, uh, and appearances and looks and stuff like that. So they'll still play very safe, but then they'll address the topic of it can look like anything, but they'll still do it within a paradigm of mm -hmm. total social safety and like further ensuring and encapsulating themselves in sort of an atmosphere of acceptance. Whereas I, I know very clearly before I make a choice to decide to express myself in a certain way, and a lot of times it's just how it comes out, and it's just authentic and uh, spontaneous. But there has been there have been moments where I was very aware before I was about to express something that there were alternate ways to express it. And just scanning them and feeling them, and almost a little bit out of principle feeling that no, this really is the most authentic way right now to carry this message. Um, and there is no personal emotion behind it. Uh, let's say I'm using a cuss word or something like that, or I'm calling out certain uh, type of group consciousness or a certain type of taboo, then I've been well aware that uh, that's going to affect my public image. And the feeling behind it is, or the message behind that is, or the encouragement, the invitation behind that is, and also in a sense, the test behind it is like, I don't, I don't want to go much lower than that. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to cater to what's socially acceptable. Because if you're not able to see beyond words into the heart of someone's intent or space from which they come, or if you cannot decipher the message when it comes in, um, either something cryptic or, or something that's fully in your face, and it just kind of triggers you, then first of all, you're not really ready for the message that's carried by that form, by that expression. Damn. 
and which is kind of the principle of paradox and confusion are the gatekeepers to enlightenment. Um, and just wanting to stay with that, like wanting to make sure that at the end of the day, uh, I feel that I've been super authentic, regardless of the consequences of my self image, or my public image. Um, and then the irony, like seeing how people will critique that, and then just being surprised that, well, not surprised so much, but um, I suppose fascinated in a sense, by But by how stuck people really are in social, socially accepted behavior, and and thought streams and cultural themes and all that. Because for example, I'm just using myself an example, but I'm trying to get a topic across. Um, that somehow it's baffled me that it's not been obvious to many people that I deliberately choose to express myself in that way. And that um, the consideration that if someone does that, uh, why would someone why would someone willingly or deliberately risk their public image? Uh, being critiqued and all that. And the only reason would either be stupidity or mindlessness, which I think is hard to, um, to judge me as. <laughs> Um, or it's because someone generally wants to get a message across. But that whole thing is not really understood, like the seeing beyond the service level of things and seeing beyond the paradoxes. I didn't get the last thing you said. The justification is either that you're like mindless or stupid, or what was the alternative? You said trying to get a perspective across? Let's say someone expresses themselves and it obviously will risk their public image. Mm -hmm or it, it will risk, quote, unquote, lowering their public status or image or whatever, um, or how respected they will be. And you see this like in not just spiritual teachings, but that's where I kind of am like frowning a little bit like, come on. Uh, but you see it in celebrities all the time, you see it in politicians all the time, it's nothing new and people just cater to that dance, or they da dance to that tune of continuing to perpetuate falling for people it's so easy for a politician, it's so easy for a celebrity to say what you want to hear. And I don't think people understand how easy it is as a public person to say what you want to hear. Because anyone who is a celebrity, anyone who has a following for longer than two days, uh, and that has somewhat of a brain, and if you manage to be a celebrity for a certain amount of time, you're going to have the experience with how people respond to you. And you're going to be extra aware of social norms and social taboos and what you should, what you should not say. And I mean, a lot of people get PR training and stuff like that. And it just strikes me as funny that people don't understand that by the very nature of that, it is inauthentic. Like to get nothing wrong with getting PR training, it's understandable to further a certain cause from time to time. But but at the end of the day, wouldn't you prefer authenticity over someone just saying what they know you want to hear, then where is the authenticity? And where is the value in trusting a person like that, and where they're coming from? And where's the value? Or how can you trust the merits of what they're saying? If where they're coming from, is just pleasing what you want to hear, and dancing to that tune of what's socially acceptable. And I've been amazed by the gullibility of the masses to judge someone who's authentic. And because of their words, because of the way they carry themselves, because of the way perhaps they, they dress or express something or show something, um, yet do that anyway, even though it's obvious, but it's not obvious to a lot of people, that they're doing that knowing that it will affect their public status in our current uh, sort of coddled society but they choose somehow they choose to do it anyway. So what I was saying is either it's because they're completely blind to it. And they're just dumb people that just express themselves, and they have no knowledge that this is going to come across as uh, controversial or a little edgy or triggering. 
But very rarely is that actually the case. Because again, if someone has a public following that is significant, especially for longer than a few days, or weeks or months, then they're going to be aware of that. They're going to be very aware of that. Because they get critique every day, all day long on everything they write and post. So the public is training them into what's publicly acceptable, what's not publicly acceptable. But by very definition, I'm just baffled by the fact that people don't appreciate authenticity anymore. Um, they rather judge what someone says or how they say it or how to express themselves. And from my angle, that's done almost deliberately. Like if I feel I have this choice point where I could take the safe route and I know that, oh, people will love this and it'll be all fine and it'll be beautiful and they'll be like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> uh, or I can take route B where I know some people will be like, what did he say? Why did, um, I got to think twice now. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's so obvious, like, I wouldn't want to follow anybody who is not authentic in that way. I wouldn't want to follow anyone who just tells me what they think I want to hear, because then where is the messenger? Where is the message? Where's the authenticity? Where's the example of courage? Where's the example of someone truly caring about me? Um, and I've tried to make it a priority. And I encourage everyone that has a following, whether it's just, you know, 500 friends, or whether it's like thousands of people, millions of people, I really encourage celebrities and politicians and spiritual teachers, most of all, because that's just kind of my field, to just drop the fear of the social status thing and start to break through those taboos, start, start to challenge those taboos. And I say, especially in spiritual uh, teachers, because we're here to free each other up. We're here to become authentic. We're here to become radically aligned, to see through the mist of man-made social contraptions and to see the truth of everything, like ourselves, our thoughts, nice. our emotions, our behaviors, our society, uh, the truth of enlightenment, ultimately, ideally. And I, I just feel a little yucky when I witness and so many people like, mm, mm, mm. so then I'm like extra inspired, typically, or I'm like extra motivated to choose option B, even though I know, like, I'm gonna get shit for this. Um, or, or, the, or the brand or the image is going to get shit for this, or someone's going to write a nasty article about this and like link that to this event and like make some kind of non existent connection. But how can I not choose option B if my sole intention, my uh, whole teaching life has been to make it a priority to make sure that what I do and what I say is because I care about the recipient. I don't say it for myself. And I've just been baffled with the lack of intelligence and clarity that a lot of people have, and how they jump on the bandwagon of that when they see an opportunity to boast themselves. Um, in certain cases, um, like other teachers will be will be boasting or trying to put down, in this case, me, but again, it's just an example, there's other teachers out there that are really authentic. And they'll jump on that bandwagon to further encapsulate their own status in sort of this socially acceptable. And it's like, yeah, what are we doing? It's so yucky. It's so yucky. Like, just say the truth and just say it in the way that it comes spontaneously across the mirror of your consciousness when you're reflecting a certain topic to humanity. Mm -hmm. And double, triple, quadruple, quintillion ripple check. <laughs> Why am I saying what I'm saying? Am I saying this? because I actually care about the recipient who's going to hear it. And if I care about them, how can I care about them, who they truly are, their potential, and where they're at? How can I care about that and still choose option A that will not reach as deep as option B and that will not carry the message as truthfully and as directly as option B? How, how can I live with myself at the end of the day by choosing option A because I know oh, if I choose option B, then, you know, and I just find it yucky, to be honest. And um, I'd really love to see the spiritual community and spiritual teachers step up their game and just um, do what they want to do, express what they want to express and be authentic in that way. And don't try to boost your self image. Just speak the truth, speak the message and address the audience as uh, to the best of your ability to know your audience address the audience, make sure that what you say 
is set because the recipient calls for it and desires it and needs for it, speak to their potential, expose their potential and expose what's holding them back from that potential. And don't play this mind game of coddling everyone's egos. And uh, for the most part, coddling your own ego. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit rare that I see someone who does that. And then my, my heart just lights up. It's like instant recognition, which is what I had with Anurag, yeah, for example. Yeah, just thinking about Anurag. I just met Anurag, and it's like, this dude gets it. He is authentic to the fucking core. Um, and neither of us is perfect. But but just that recognition of someone who's, who's, who's burned through that self-image need. And you know that whatever they'll say, it's because it's fucking authentic in that moment. And it's because they actually care about you. It's because they've actually arrived at some kind of a place of integrity that is not bullshittable. And it's not, it doesn't go through certain language barriers. And um, I'm not saying we should all be rebellious all the time and just piss everybody off. It's not a game about deliberately trying to trigger people. Um, well, because, neither of you do. Neither of you are doing that all the time. Right. No, we don't. Um, and that would be counterproductive. And in fact, that would again be about us. If we were to now jump on this bandwagon of, oh, it's really authentic to trigger people and to just say the rude thing all the time, <laughs> then we would choose option B, but actually it would then be a different version of option A, the inauthentic option. Because we'd be saying it to bolster our self-image as authentic teachers. Um, it's just about being fucking quiet in your ego every single moment, every time you express yourself, just check yourself. Do I come from this this feeling of purity in my heart, in my beingness at the root of who I am? Do I actually give a shit about the person that's hearing this right now? Or am I just trying to create an image, a persona, and bolster that and, and boost that up and one up other people? And it's just kind of sickening. It's like, especially in this community where we should be, where we should be uh, holding hands and singing Kumbaya and singing, mm. uh, fuck you, I love you sometimes and what have you. It's just, uh, it's just a pity that spiritual teachers, um, for the most part, are still so caught up in their own mental games. And I find the care for others lacking, but the same in a lot of celebrities. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's, I'm speaking to this niche, but it's just anyone, really. But especially those with a following that know. Mm -hmm. And for those without a following, just please understand how easy it is to say what you want us to say. It's very easy. We know what you want to hear. We know what you don't want to hear. We know what's acceptable. We know what's not acceptable. And it's so easy. It'd be so easy for someone like myself to cater to that and to give you exactly what you want to hear and boost my popularity and boost my image. It'd be very easy. But I refuse to do that because at the end of the day, I want to be able to know that I've cared about the people that I speak to and that I've done it for out of true service to others and not uh, to play into these games. So that's kind of been my observation in the last few days. One thing I wonder is just how much other spiritual teachers or other leaders or celebrities or whatever people with followings, how much they actually even recognize the authenticity because a lot of times they are like the even bigger opponents or like the even bigger haters or the even bigger like anti your authenticity, like you'll get more pushback from other teachers than you will from a lot of general public. So it's like, are they missing it? Are they not seeing it? Are they not seeing the authenticity or are they, and it's threatening to them? Or are people just really? That's a great question. Cause like, if I was another spiritual teacher and I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna go there. Like I didn't wanna get as authentic as you, but I saw you doing it. I would be like, thank God somebody's doing it. At right. least. And I'm, I'm like that every time I see someone do it. It's like, mm. Mm -hmm. you know, fresh air, finally, great. That's awesome. I love you forever. Like, go for it. You have my full support. Um, I think for the most part, people are not fully aware of it. And if they are partially, they're just still in the cloud of unconsciousness. Because the ego will just continuously deceive itself. It will continuously hide in the crevices of our persona and of the way that we uh, handle situations and show behavior and demonstrate. And it's just so subtle. And it does take remarkable relentlessness to really get to the bottom of these core issues and insecurities 
to the point where you are aware of the fact that what you're choosing is actually inauthentic, and you're actually trying to ensure your social safety. And a lot of people think that that's what they're doing, but they're not aware, or they think they're being super genuine, and they're just really not aware of the game. And there's others that are semi aware of it. But if you're fully aware of it, you can't do it. Like, it's just, mm -hmm. there's no way. Like, if you're fully aware of it, which means you know, all the implications that it has on your soul, also, and karmically, um, you, you wouldn't be able to have full awareness of an inauthentic action and continue it. Now, you might be somewhat conscious of it, but hiding yourself from really recognizing it, really acknowledging it, in which case, uh, you will continue along that path, kind of like conditioned momentum, and continue to sort of deceive and come up with justifications, and try to bring other things down that seem more authentic and try to make that look less authentic. And I think sometimes people actually don't realize that that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it, because if they were fully to realize that, if they'd still do it, then they're just genuinely service to self oriented, they're just actually egotistical um, entities that are here to play the game of what I can get, and not the game of what I can give. Mm. Mm. So but I think that's more rare, I think more typical, it's a lack of full awareness. Mm -hmm. It also feels like when you choose to be inauthentic, it's like you're ignoring your responsibility and your honor to the people that you're here to be of service to. Beautiful word, it's completely dishonoring. Mm -hmm. And it has repercussions, they just don't realize that it does. So they're also shooting themselves in the foot. Mm. What do you feel is that responsibility or that honor to the people that are listening to your message? Well, ultimately, I think it really is, and this and it's going to sound paradoxical, but it is about honoring, honoring your own purest alignment as, as you possibly can. Typically, when we make it about other people, we tend to hide our tendencies. We tend, we tend to deceive ourselves, we tend to justify things. Whereas, for me, it's like the purest over over the years, what's felt the purest and the purest and the purest has been to just really stay with myself. That's been the, the only way that I've been able to make sure that I'm as purely in my service to others as I can be, is by not trying to do it for them. But just knowing sensing, tuning in, meditating on any kind of impurity surrounding my motivations, any kind of impurity surrounding my choice to express in a certain way. And by keeping it by by keeping it about my own alignment to purity, integrity and truth, and like upping that standard over and over again, naturally, that spills out into everything that one then says and expresses, and then one is so fully aware of it that one cannot help but make the right choice regardless of consequences. And again, that's where courage comes in. And we train that courage, because we were so aware, we become more and more subtly aware of our alignment to what is integrity, what is authenticity, what is true care for others, without falling in the trap of like, Oh, I'm all about others, sort of the, the fake altruistic trap, which is mm -hmm. just another trap. It's about energy management, not management, but like sensitivity. Like, am I, what's impure about my current action? What's impure about my current choice or expression? What's impure about how I'm posing myself right now? And just relaxing that surrendering that spotting it, identifying it, acknowledging it, and letting it go, and making room for this natural spontaneity, that just expresses according to its best ability to judge how to express itself in order to actually lend the message with the audience. I know it sounds ironic, because if I use a cuss word, or I call you guys idiots, sometimes people will say like, well, how is that going to that's not about them, that's about you, you're just an asshole. So again, I'm just baffled by the fact that people cannot see beyond the service, into the heart of the intention behind an expression, and they're more eager to judge the words, mm -hmm. according to social standards than they are to, to see someone's fire to see someone's passion for the truth to see someone's open heart. Um, and I think this is lacking both in leaders and, and celebrities and so forth and politicians, and spiritual teachers, unfortunately. And it's lacking also in the people who receive uh, their messages. 
And so it's this weird phenomena, and I'm just baffled by it, that people cannot see authenticity from inauthenticity, that they can't recognize it, and that they'll, they'll go after the expression, even though the intention behind the expression is significantly purer than the intention behind the expression that you that that coddles you and that you like and that you can socially accept and that you can share with your friends because God, no. oh this is socially acceptable let me share this beautiful message i also know that a lot of my work is not going to get shared because people don't want to post it on their pages they may love it in silence or they may leave a little heart a little anonymous heart or <laughs> they may comment like oh i'm so glad you say it which is great i appreciate that but then it's also like who's going to who's going to if you stand for that so to speak or if you align with that and you feel the mm. truth in it there's not a lot of people that want to then continue to pay that forward and risk that social judgment um so i think we all have a responsibility to increase the authenticity and the integrity and the honesty and the self-sacrifice image sacrifice the willingness the courage to burn up into other people's judgment if need be so that at the end of the day at the end of your life you can, you know that every important expression you've ever made and the larger you're following you could say it shouldn't really matter whether one person listens to you or a million per people listen to you it shouldn't really matter but at a certain relative observational level you could suggest hypothetically that the greater you're following the more important it becomes to check in with how authentic the motivation behind your expression is but at the end of the day we all whether we're the ones speaking or the ones receiving or the ones sharing, we have a responsibility to up the vibrational authenticity and transparency on this planet right now. And if we don't, we're just going to sink down into this hole of continued inauthenticity, lack of transparency, um, and like picking things apart based on words, based on words, based on dress code, based on cigars, based on and it really is the gatekeeper, like this paradox. It's not even that paradoxical. You just tune into someone <laughs> mm -hmm. and you feel if they're authentic or not. And it's so obvious, doesn't matter what the fuck they say. If they're mm -hmm. authentic and they're burning with this fire of passion for you and they're doing this work for the sake of you and it's so obvious, then it's obvious, it's not paradoxical, but, but to the human condition, socially conditioned mind, it seems paradoxical and therefore Paradox and confusion are the gatekeepers to enlightenment. And it's supposed to be that way because nobody, nobody that, they're gatekeepers for a reason. If you cannot even pass that level of consciousness, mm -hmm. you have no business exploring the topic of enlightenment. You have no business diving deep into yourself because you're going to find, you're going to find a hundred thousand lies every day that you're telling yourself. You're going to find a hundred thousand layers of self-deception. You have no business. You're not ready. That's why they're the gatekeepers. If you cannot pass a fuck you or a, you're an idiot, you're a moron and seek through that into the heart of where someone comes from. And you prefer, you prefer messages like, oh, I'm so sorry for you. And like, yeah, you have all the right to be angry and da da da. da. And you can't <laughs> see that someone is actually just, they don't give a shit about you nine out of 10 times. They don't give a shit about you. They don't give a shit about you. They're coming from their own programming for for making sure that they don't become criticized that they remain popular it's contradictory to caring about the recipient so but if people can't see beyond labels and words and imagery and certain choices on the service and they can't see in beyond that and that's often why i actually almost on principle choose the more controversial option again i don't do this all the time because it's not always the best carrier for a message but sometimes it is by far the best carrier for a certain message and and one develops that sensitivity to know when that is more and more i then deliberately choose that option especially if it carries greater value in the end or at least i believe it does or greater authenticity if it's a more authentic carrier for the message that wants to come through or for what's called for by the being that calls for that information. I'm even more inclined to choose that because 
because it's like that test, like if you can't see through this, then you Damn. really have no business uh, mm -hmm. with the teaching of this uh, level of self investigation and transcendence and transparency. So they are natural gatekeepers. So I guess it's all perfect. <laughs> mm -hmm. It feels like if you choose to be inauthentic, then you get inauthentic responses, and it just keeps the programming in this loop. Absolutely. Yeah. We just get trapped. It's like the extreme generosity of putting your own self image as the gatekeeper. Like that is the thing that you are using as your transaction. Like it's completely unprecedented. Like it's generosity that people aren't even, will never know personally, probably. But it seems so normal to me. It seems like why in the world would you choose anything else? It doesn't seem remarkable to me. It seems remarkable to me that people don't do that. Mm -hmm. It seems remarkable to me that people uh, built these shells around their passion, their fire, their truth, their integrity, and their love for others. That's what seems remarkable to me. And um, it's just a waste of a, it's just a waste of humanity. It's just mm -hmm. a waste of the potential of our relationships worldwide. And especially, like I say, especially in spiritual teachings, I believe you have the duty to be, to stand as upright as you can, to be as honest as you can be. Um, and to not cater to what people want to hear, but actually tune into what's the best carrier for this message in this moment. And if that is to say you're a fucking moron, wake <laughs> the fuck up, Nice. then that's what should come through. But yeah, there's not a lot of people that seem to be doing that because that would not appear very enlightened. Right? And they have to deal with what you have to deal with. Like it makes sense in a way, like there's actually a huge repercussions socially if that's where your allegiance is. Right, there are repercussions, yeah. And people don't want that. So they fear the repercussions. <laughs> they fear the consequences. So they'll and that's fine. Play it safe if you want to. There's safe messages for people that need safety. And that's great. It's just not me. Um, but but that is valid. There's people who are deeply traumatized and they need a lot of trauma healing and they need all that. So they need to be cuddled before they can be awoken. Cuddled or coddled? Cuddled. Cuddled. Oh. Sorry, yeah, yeah. No, or cuddled. Maybe probably both. <laughs> Same thing a little bit, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, so great, I appreciate that. But don't mistaken, uh, don't mistaken that for naturally always have meaning it's authentic or caring or loving, because oftentimes it's not necessarily. Um, and sometimes it is, but yeah, people don't want to deal with consequences. I don't want to deal with consequences. <laughs> it's not pleasant. So <laughs> you, and you know you're going to get shitstorm of this and that and like negative energies and this and attacks and what have you. Um, it's not good for business. It's not good for your image. It's not good for your personal life. It's not good for hardly anything. But at the end of your life, what when you facing uh, what's this guy's name? Saint Peter. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, the, the gates gatekeeper. Guy. Yeah, and you're yeah. forced to see every single every single fucking detail of your mm -hmm. thought process. What would you like to see? Wow. I've deliberately chosen certain expressions, like even tailored them, like tailor made them to what I knew would rub people the wrong way. Again, if I felt for the most part anyway, that that carried the message ultimately with greater integrity. But certain expressions like the way the ways that I've dressed in different ways, uh, uh, smoking cigars, posting pictures with cigars or without cigars, all those are choices. Um, for the most part, oftentimes, they're spontaneous, it just feels good, but sometimes they're deliberate, and they are, I'm aware of the consequences, and there's sort of a, a reviewing process that I go through beforehand, and weighing the options of what feels the most to carry the greatest uh, integrity and the most potency. Um, and also to see that like, people really do identify you with how you dress. People really do identify you with the words that you, you choose. People really do identify you with whether you mm -hmm. smoke a cigar or not, mm -hmm. um, or whether you use rude language or, or nice language. Um, and because of that tendency, again, if anything, I feel more inclined, I feel a little bit more biased towards Mm -hmm. because not many people are doing it. So if, if there was like 80% of the people doing it, then great, I could take a back seat from time to time, not uh, 
not go as uh, edgy or controversial per se, because there'd be great balance in these communities and stuff. But now it's like, well, mm-hmm. uh, someone's got to break through this through this taboo of what enlightenment is, what it's not, what it looks like, what it doesn't look like, and uh, yeah, it'd be it'd just be great if everybody did more of that, and if the recipients could see more through the surface level of things, and not judge based on things they don't understand or that rub them the wrong way. And again, if you can't handle a combination of lines on a piece of paper, and that upsets you. You need trauma work. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think a lot of people kind of stay stuck in that cycle when they don't have to, when they're beyond being a victim, and they want to step it up. But still, they choose to kind of like, deliberately almost feel like complacent in their disempowerment towards like, oh, he used, oh, he used this word, well, he lost his uh, mind completely, he's a psychopath. <laughs> um, or narcissist or whatever. Um, and it's also fun to see that those who are rubbed the wrong way by labels, they have a they have a library of labels available to judge that. It's like a it's like a label warfare. It's like uh, <laughs> what's this thing? I don't even know what it means. Oh, classic gaslighting. Or like uh, I don't even know what it means. I just know I hear it all the time. Oh, you're gaslighting. Oh, okay. Well, that really solves the situation, doesn't it? Yeah. We're really getting to the bottom of it now. Because you've called this by a word that like that further boosts your sort of victimization, right? And your your justifications to to be better than the other person because they use a root word and so how dare they they must be uh, gaslighting or they must turn around on you. Therefore they go. It's like and they use these words, narcissist. Oh, okay. Well you figured me out. People see labels. Mm-hmm. That's what they see. They no longer see the entity. They no longer see the passion. They no longer see the heart. They no longer see the but what do you think actually causes them to come up? Like, it's not just seeing, it's not just hearing the word fuck come out of your mouth. Like it's, they are threatened by something. Like, For sure. Yeah. By their own bullshit, by their own self-deceit. <laughs> and the ego never wants to see its own games. It never wants to see its own victimization because then it loses mm-hmm. the right to postpone its self-responsibility. <laughs> so yeah, that's not comfortable, right? Having to face yourself. And sometimes, again, like I said, there are cases, and maybe many cases, maybe more than I give credit for, or more than I cater to anyway, in my work. But there's teachers for that. That's great, right? We don't all have to teach the same audience or demographic or standard or level. Um, There are people that genuinely won't be able to hear a message if you use the word idiot. Like, oh, it stops their whole process. It's Mm -hmm. offensive to them. Okay, well, it's not an ideal state to be. I would encourage you to look into why you're so disempowered by a line on Mm -hmm. the piece of paper and can't therefore see into the truth of the situation or the person or the dialogue anymore. While you're so swayed by labels and words, please investigate it for your own sake. Um, But for the most part, I think I think people should grow up a little bit. Like there's a lot of people that are ready to break out of that shell and they Mm -hmm. just refuse to because it's not comfortable to begin to face the self. Because if there's a particular word or phrase that triggers people, a lot of people use it to maybe unintentionally, but they disempower themselves by reacting to it. But they could really empower themselves, like you're saying, by investigating it and looking at it. So it's kind of like your triggers are your gateway into freedom, but a lot of people don't see it as that. Mm-hmm. They don't recognize it as that. Right. Yeah. Well, at some point, I guess they will. It's like, this is a good example too. Now, like the, how people will continue to justify this, like me as a bad person or me as a, um, as a hypocrite or whatever it is, is like, they'll say, well, look at him. He's all emotional. Like he's reacting. It's clearly not in peace or balance. And it's just another way to not see past the surface of things. And just to always like look for what, what, how someone is wrong and because of what they're saying, or how they're expressing themselves. And it completely blinds us from being able to actually relate to actually know another entity more clearly, more truthfully. And if we refuse to know another entity more clearly, more truthfully, and we choose to to exacerbate that and express that and make a point out of that, it's violence. It's abuse. It's energetically abusing. It's a form of abuse. Um, so, but the people that are so caught up in words, 
they're all fixated on anti-abuse. And they're some of the most sort of back, back what's the word? Um, backwards? Well, their approach is very backwards. Mm -hmm. It's like they're doing the very thing. They're, they're the example mm -hmm. energetically, if you could see subtler at subtler levels, they're energetically the very example of the thing that they say they're being so righteous about opposing and bringing down and all that stuff. So anyway, people always find something to not have to actually relate to another entity as they are. Uh, they just want to hear their own story. They just want to make their own point. They just want to boost their own ego mm -hmm. for the most part. And there's also a lot of amazing people out there that are waking up from that, have already woken up from that, and are even beginning to pass on this torch of authenticity and, and radical honesty, um, which is great. I mean, I love it every time I see it. It's just kind of still a little, um, how do you say it, sparse? Sparse. Scars. Scars? 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 Sparse? Sparse or scarce? We're like once yeah. every hundred people. Scarce. Sparse. 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 I think sparse, no? Yeah, I think sparse. Like not, not very often in yeah. small amounts. Anyway, you get the point. Uh, I'd love to see, I'd love to see everybody step up their game, like both receivers and leaders or content creators and followers, however you want to call these two categories. We're all people, we're all beings. We all vibrationally contribute to planet Earth, to this collective, to the example that we are in our everyday lives. And um, just see me out to service a little deeper, like try a little harder, actually care about the other entity that you're interacting with. Actually care to know people don't just make, make stuff up and like feel comfortable and hide behind your own labels. Because you didn't like a label that they used or what they used. Use it as an opportunity to awaken yourself. I think that'd be good for this collective. Hmm. Also, people don't get the paradox that from a really clear state of consciousness, you can emotionally or passionately express yourself for their for their well being, like because you're noticing a topic, you're noticing someone is stuck, you notice they're stuck repeatedly, you notice a way out, and you know that the way out is to offer something that will shock them a little bit, because obviously, when they're not shocked, they continue the pattern that they're in. So a little bit of shock and awe every time is a very helpful teaching tool. And what happened that we can no longer do that, like, in the history of spirituality, if you look at the hardcore, or not even the hardcore, more like the standard of the inner core teachings, you'd have to sit for years on a fucking brick to prove your worth, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and people complain about whatever, having to pay $22 for something or like, because then you're a maniac, <laughs> you're a psychopath. Um, or like, or being tested a little bit, like giving some words and labels as edgy, like, can you see through this stuff? I mean, again, the old masters would turn around their graves. And just, they saw like the cuddling that we did today. And so I guess, again, like I do come to the conclusion that it is perfect. Like people aren't ready if they can't pass the gatekeepers of confusion and paradox. Um, and it shouldn't be any different. Ideally, they are able to face those gatekeepers and pass that test. But the test itself shouldn't change. And mm -hmm. the fact that people that are not able to pass the gatekeepers are therefore mm -hmm. not able to really enter into that, the true realm of spirituality, that true enlightenment, that true self transcendence, because they simply can't. So it is a natural sort of barrier or, or threshold. I'm just really surprised when I see spiritual teachers, or like leaders or like right. movie actors that play the most courageous superheroes and like they're worshipped. And then I see their messaging and I'm like, you're just, it's so, it's on, it's all over your face, my friend. Like, you're just like, you're just boosting your self image by saying this thing that you're supposed to say right now. Really? <laughs> like, really? Like, really? Because otherwise, what? Who do you care about? You care about your self image, your ego? Are you that insecure? Or do you care about the recipients? Or do you actually care about the message? And that's the irony, because people, <laughs> the way to be liked is to share messages about how much you care, and to be into philanthropy, and to make this donation here, and to post a black picture, and whatever it is, or <laughs> do whatever you're supposed to do. Because that means, in the eyes of an untrained civilization, that for the most part, portrays more sheep-like behavior than not, 
and you're in a position where you are looked up to, you're a leader, and you're catering to that, that makes you a sheep, it doesn't make you a leader. Um, why do you do that? Like, the only reason you do that is because you're a sheep, it's because you're insecure yourself, and because you make it about your insecurities, and not it's not actual care. So like, I just get a little nauseous with the degree, the amount of messaging that I feel and see vibrationally out there. And again, if you can see energetically and stuff, you can, you're going to see way more of this, you become super sensitive to all the layers that are in a people's uh, person's consciousness. And then so you see all these people use the message of caring about others to bolster their own care for themselves, which exemplify they don't give a shit. And that's just the inauthenticity that's pervasive throughout our society. And it's fine, whatever. But sometimes, therefore, I feel like countering that a little bit um, at the expense and generating some consequences for me and the team and, and logistics and what have you. But at the end of the day, that feels better to me than... than and it's what brought every, all of us to you in the first place. It's what attracted us to you in the first place. Mm -hmm. that level of courage and honesty. Mm -hmm. But then how to educate people that aren't, that aren't there yet, or just don't? Um, I don't know, I guess we're trying. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just make it known, make it obvious, make it aware, like the more obvious we make it and the less we, the less we cater to that type of social standard. And the more we scrutinize why we do what we do. Why am I saying this? I'm not saying it because it, why am I being kind right now? Why am I being, why am I choosing all the sweet words in my vocabulary right now with this person, with this neighbor, with my friend, with my colleague? And does that match my actual authentic experience? Now, I'm not saying that if you have a problem with someone, you should act problematic or that you should then become like, uh, like, oh, it's more authentic to call you an asshole, so I'll just call you an asshole. Well, sometimes, yeah, that might be the most authentic thing to do. But I agree, we should come from love as much as we can, we should be kind as much as we can. But when it becomes detrimental and self serving, then it's no longer authentic. So we got to question that. Um, and just question why we interact in the way that we do and scrutinize every single fucking letter of why you say what you say, what why you do what you do, why you dress how you dress, why you type what you type, how you respond to these social stigmas and all that. Are you really doing it? Because that's truly the extent of your wisdom into that topic that you're expressing about? Or are you doing it because uh, if you don't, you'll lose a million followers, or uh, your products won't sell as well, or people will start critiquing you. And just every day you die a little bit more if you continue to do that if you continue not to do what I just suggested, if you continue to just kind of use altruism to bolster your self care, pretending you care about others, because everybody else thinks this is the way to care about people. And these are the words to say, Oh, I said, wow, how brilliant you're able to make the exact correct statement that people want to hear. You, you care about them so much, you must care about them so much that you went through the effort to say exactly what they want you to hear. Um, and that's the, that, that signifies to me the extent of your wisdom, the extent of your courage, the extent of your integrity. And uh, you know, no business having dinner with you. That's all I'll say to that. <laughs> I was curious about something you said earlier. You said from a clear s state of consciousness, you can use emotions in your expression. Like, how is that different? from being emotional when you're not coming from a clear space of consciousness? It's not personal. It doesn't linger. Mm -hmm. It leaves no trace in your own consciousness. That meaning after the act has been completed, uh, there's no process about it. Um, it's childlike, it's spontaneous. And a lot, like all the sages in the past have been reported to suddenly burst out and dance or, mm -hmm. or laughter or suddenly tell a joke out of nowhere or tell a story and like have tears stream down their face when they're supposedly enlightened and nothing bothers them. Um, but people don't understand that paradox. 
that on one level, there can be a profound care and devotion. And even though separation has been dissolved and seen through. Yeah, it's just paradoxical, I suppose, which I understand at that level, I understand that people don't quite grok that paradox. Um, but just know that it's very possible to completely impersonally from a state of total freedom of any emotions to be emotionally moved uh, in your expression. And I'll make the claim that that is always for others it, in that state. Anyway, it is for the uh, participants, it is for the recipients. Um, and the people who are able to be in that what I call the mirror state, they, they're the only ones who will know what I'm talking about, where the it's like a feeling spontaneously comes out of nowhere that has nothing to do with yourself. And it's, it's going through the causal body, so to speak, it's going through the cell body and the physical body. And it's expressing itself, it's, it's, it's calling forth to be expressed. And you don't always know why with your intellect. But you've come to trust that sensation. And so you'll use your bodies, you're not filtering it, that, that's what the ego would do. You're not like holding it back, that's what the ego would do. If that's what's coming up, and there is very little to no ego, then that transparency would spontaneously allow that occurrence to happen. And it feels very different to one who has been trained in this, who has attained a high state of consciousness, that's very transparent. It's clearly felt the difference between when there's an emotion or a personal process, um, or a past memory that has some remnants of charge behind it. Um, or when it's or when it's a reaction to something or when it's absolutely free of reaction. But nevertheless, the same energetics come up, they feel different, but uh, to the untrained eye, they feel the same, like, because mm -hmm. the emotional energy still courses through the body, the physical energy still courses through the nervous system, the tears still come from the eyes. But th inside, there's a total clear and transparent and transcendent witnessing that happens. And it's like, the ocean just temporarily expresses itself as a stormy wave, and then it disappears and it leaves no trace. So, to, but to the untrained eye, to someone who doesn't understand this paradox, um, they will associate the wave expression with the state of that entity or the intention of that entity. But it has a childlike, spontaneous nature to it, these expressions, when they're, when they're called for in someone who is empty of self not just intellectually empty of self, not psychologically trained themselves to think about emptiness, but actual, powerful, realized emptiness, that emptiness will channel whoever is around in certain ways, and it will mirror, it will share, it will reflect whatever is in greatest benefit, it will express, it will be called forth from that beingness. Um, the observers then will identify typically will associate that expression to be a reflection of the opinion of that entity, mm -hmm. or the state of emotion or consciousness or the mental state of that entity, or will take it as a sign of reactivity. Um, and that's the paradox. But yeah, what do you get when you stand in front of a mirror? Like you'll see yourself without the mirror, you won't see certain aspects of yourself. If you have a pimple over here, but you didn't realize it because it happened in your sleep, you don't know it until you stand in front of a mirror. And we all have a shitload of pimples when it comes to our psychology that we're not aware of yet. And so the higher selves, if you will, or the intelligence inherent in each entity loves the opportunity for their personal body mind, their lower self, if you will, to go visit someone who has attained mirror consciousness. They love it. it mirror consciousness is in high demand. I'll tell you, strangers will act very strange towards you or like mm. call for certain responses and reaction mm. to the degree where like out of common sense, almost out of self protection, um, out of being able to sustain yourself, you have to kind of shield and, um, and not fully engage with all these things, because it, it would just get nowhere. So but there's a high demand for mirrors in the psychology of uh, entities, because that intelligence in each entity, that is unbeknownst to the conscious mind of that entity, wants to see itself. 
it wants to get something reflected that it could never get fully exposed or reflected in a relationship with another person who is not transparent to this mirror state. Because, and this is the reason why we attract this type of relationship, that type of relationship, these types of friends, these types of themes. We, it's like we get 5% of a reflection from this person, but that's all we can get because they're 90, they're blocked by their own personality and their own biases. So now it's a warfare of reflections. And it's this mixed bag of reflections, and it's not a clear reflection. Um, plus, we don't even know typically that that's what's happening, that we're just reflecting each other for learning purposes. But in the case of a mirror, 100% of the availability of what can come through that entity is 100% tailored to you, undistorted by that personal entity's personal mind. And so they're in high demand, because you can you can get a lifetime of reflections in a very short interaction, sometimes not even in a single word being spoken, just energetically, vibrationally, through body language, or a eye gaze, or an energetic exchange. So as a mirror, you're in high demand. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, typically, it's a beautiful sight, and it's not always a pretty sight, sometimes it can get a little murky, not for the mirror, but in the appearance. And the fastest way to learn is for that entity to understand that it's looking into a mirror, regardless of whether the person that they're in the presence of is actually has actually attained what I call mirror consciousness, or if that person is, is just your average Joe filled with their own conditioning and their own unconsciousness and all that. Regardless, the fastest way to learn is to be aware of the fact that you're that you're attracting people into your conscious environment for the purpose mainly of reflecting your unconscious, the pimples that you're not aware you have, so to speak, so that you can know yourself, that you can have free choice in who you are, that you can bring awareness to these things. But it's super powerful if someone knows, and this is the lost art of balanced devotion, which used to be, uh, in my opinion, in my understanding, used to be much more commonplace in spirituality before the whole modern age than it is today. And now devotion is frowned upon, like, mm -hmm. because it's, uh, it reminds people of so many other things and like cults and giving your power away and things. But there's a there's a vast difference between being devoted to someone as your mirror, which accelerates your learning so much, and like it benefits your growth so much. There's, that's very different from idolizing somebody, or giving your power away to them, or but it's a lost, the lost art of devotion. It's a mm. lost art of surrender. It's a lost art of trusting. And I'm not saying people should suddenly blindly trust people because you do need to somehow figure out if what you're staring into is actually a mirror, or if it is a person with their own selfish intent. So by all means, keep your guards up. Um, but there is a lost art of surrender or devotion, which um, which if somehow that type of relationship is established with a mirror, and a person who really wants to use the mirror as a mirror and not try to make that mirror a person, or like try to associate the expressions as being reflections of their own personal points of view or opinions. It's the fastest way, it's the, by far the fastest way to learn no book can do this. No, Yeah, I don't know of any other teaching method that is the most direct and the most, uh, the most potent. But it requires the student to really be ready for that too. And to be able to carry themselves already with a sense of confidence and independence so that it doesn't turn into idolization, because that's a distortion, then the then that same magic can't happen. It's got to be that true art of true surrender, not surrender, even devotion is a better word, like balanced devotion to to understanding what that exchange really is all about and using it in the most efficient way for one's own growth. But this happens unconsciously all the time in our society. Like, uh, people seek out mirrors or people that are more able to be mirrors than others, because there's it's a spectrum. It's not a black or white per se. And then typically the people that are the most transparent, that are closer, even if only by a percentage, well, it should be a little bit more than that. But if if there is a, a somewhat significant difference between 
one person in a relationship and the other person in a relationship when it comes to their transparency to the truth, to the mirror state, to the God state, to true clarity, to a clear consciousness, free of bias. Um, if there's a quite a significant difference between that one person in the relationship, even if it's a regular partnership relationship or a friendship, then quite naturally, that being who is more transparent will act predominantly as the teacher, whether or not that is seen. Now, every time we teach, we learn. Every time we learn, we teach. So it's not a separate thing. Um, and it's not about better or worse or like more valuable and less valuable. But naturally, just by the f metaphysics of it, just it's the physics of the invisible, it's the physics of consciousness, the physics of energy. That being will become like sort of the shepherd figure in that situation, or the teacher, predominantly the teacher role. Um, and you see this all the time, like every relationship is teacher student. Mm -hmm. yeah. And usually it exchanges itself and goes back and forth, or it's at the same time, and it can get really confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> That's why relationships are so confusing. Uh, the ultimate relationship is from the eager student to the true mirror. That is the ultimate when it comes to the perspective of learning and the growth and the reason that we're here to mm -hmm. wake up to who we really are. That's the most potent. Uh, it's not really a relationship, but that's the most potent dynamic mm -hmm. that two beings could have. Um, and it's the most beneficial to the creator. It's the most direct path to the creator knowing itself in that exchange. But again, we do this all the time. It's just shaded by so many layers of distortions that it's hard to uh, see what's going on for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there seems to be such a bad rap now around having a teacher-student relationship. But only really in like a spiritual context. That's what kind of surprises me or perplexes me. I mean, when people make that comment to me about like, yeah, having a spiritual teacher and how that's like unhealthy or imbalanced or it's like, but if I, if this was my piano teacher yeah. who was just better at piano than me, you, you wouldn't bat an eye. But because this person is a spiritual teacher who is, practiced more, studied more along a spiritual path than I have, it's somehow risky or sketchy or... Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's filled with paradox. Like, uh, I'm a cult leader for posting uh, <laughs> messages on Instagram, right? Or like having, um, having events where people pay some money to go to the event. But if you look at how many people die yearly at concerts of their idols, and selling t-shirts and that's great that's not a cult or like uh <laughs> po politician rallies and all that stuff and like the hats and the again the flags and the t-shirts and the flags of the country and the riots and the riots and that's all good <laughs> that's all caring that's like oh we care so much but if um if a spiritual teacher if someone claims that they may be able to help you know yourself better yeah, it's a dangerous cult for sure. What the fuck is that even about? Like, why is that the most threatening thing? It's like the only real threatening thing, it seems like, actually. Because the ego doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. It likes wow. to continue to deceive itself. So it'll, it'll attack whatever it can to prevent itself from having to acknowledge itself. And uh, an artist or a, a boy band or whatever, girl band, <laughs> doesn't... <laughs> nice and balanced. Oh, yeah, yeah, I had I had to add in a girl band, otherwise I'd be a masochist or like what do you call it? Uh, Not pa masochist. <laughs> All these labels they're confusing now. Narcissist, sociopath, uh, masochist, masochist, masochist. Uh, pa what's it? Pa pa patriarch. Yeah, patriarch. Yeah. Anyway, all these labels. We don't know who we are anymore. We don't know who other people are. We can't. We can't treat every moment anymore as the moment that it is because it's all been labelized, it's all been categorized, it's all been predetermined. So you can, as soon as you have a label applied to a situation, you no longer are able, you're no longer are in your right mind to accurately, objectively assess what that situation is about, what's true, what's not true, what's fair, what's not fair, what's balanced, what's not balanced, if it's helpful for you, not helpful for you, because you've labeled it something. So now it's that thing. But again, just the paradox of, 
of um, being called, um, let, let's say the term cult leader, or like having your cult. But if you if you go to any actor's page, or any artist's page, or boy or girl brand's page, or whatever, it's it's like total cult behavior. And it's, it's okay, it's society, it's, it's accepted. But when it comes to actually helping people wake up to who they are, and like consciously talking about these things, um, it's so threatening, somehow. And we should bring it down. And it's like, yeah, it's like you're a danger to humanity. Earlier, you said, you mentioned realized emptiness. And I do feel there's a lot of misunderstanding between like what emptiness actually means. Could you describe a bit more about what you meant by realized emptiness? Do you mean the distinction between psychologically trained emptiness mm -hmm. and truly realized emptiness or powerful emptiness? Yeah. So uh, there is also this trend in spirituality in the modern day and age with all the conferences that we have about spirituality and all the panel discussions and all the, how it's been popularized in the last 30 or so years. Um, especially in sort of the, the non-duality type of communities, just as an example, there's a lot of subgroups that I see of people who, they started out being excited about the potential of enlightenment the potential of that potential, really, the possibility of enlightenment. It struck a chord, it resonated, it um, powered their search, it excited them. And then at some point, they got tired with the practice, or they just couldn't get beyond their own minds. And then what happens over time, gradually, people don't realize this, they start to bastardize the teachings, they start to bastardize the practice, they start to come up with all kinds of bastardized versions and investigations that become more and more this sort of intellectually dense, dry state and loop. It's a trap. And it's a tricky one, because it will sound very balanced and enlightened at some point. But it's just a play of language. It's just still the mind acting as if it, it knows emptiness, or that it knows enlightenment or spirituality. In fact, it'll be so frustrated with itself at some level, that it will try to turn true enlightenment, true spirituality, which the, the psyche can never understand. It has to be attained. It is an attainment. Sorry to say. It is what's already here, yes, but it is an attainment. You either attain it or you don't attain it. And yes, there's a spectrum there. So it's not black or white in that sense, per se. But you either strive for it, and you put in the work, and you realize more and more of it, or you don't, or you become lazy, and you start working with your mental concepts of enlightenment and emptiness and so forth. And so there's a lot of teachings that mimic the quest for enlightenment, but really, it's a, it's a very, very, very dulled down intellectualized version of it, that can pose as true emptiness, it can pose as da da da, mm -hmm. and it will even deconstruct and here's where it becomes a little sinful. <laughs> it will deconstruct true enlightenment, and true spirituality, in order to fit into its complacent little box, because it failed in its attempt to attain more of it. So it's then reducing spirituality and faith and true devotion to God, the creator to understanding that you did not create any of this with your thoughts. Yes, ultimately, but not the thoughts that you know, there is a source hmm. to all the mystery and the magic and the infinite plethora of parallel realities and universes and all that. There is a source behind all of that, that has absolutely nothing to do with your brain, absolutely nothing to do with your mind. And <laughs> people try to reduce that they don't realize it, they don't attain it, they don't actually go get acquainted with true infinity, experientially beyond the mind, beyond the physical body, the mental and subtle bodies and the causal body. They don't get familiar with God, let alone the absolute or the truly infinite in its absolute undistorted state people fail to penetrate it. And yes, it's quite, it's, it's a very, very subtle material it requires a lot of desire, and practice and dedication. Uh, it's not an overnight thing for almost virtually nobody is it an overnight thing. I could pretty much say for nobody. 
But because they failed and they got tired of trying, this is a generalization, but this is mm -hmm. one motivation for it in some teachers or, or uh, sub-communities or uh, students. They got tired of it. They didn't quite get it. And now the only way to feel comfortable with their quest is to intellectualize spirituality in ways that don't seem intellectual to them. That seems like the real deal. This is why it's a trap. Um, it's a perversion of true spirituality. It's reduce, it's a form of reductionism. So not only now do they reduce their own experience by accepting psychology as being enough, but now in order to feel comfortable with that, or still feel like experts in the field, because they have all these peers looking at them and community members, and they've been going to all these satsangs and meetings for so long. Now they'll create a mental framework of teachings and investigations mm -hmm. and inquiries and so forth that will reduce true spirituality, which they have not attained. And if they have glimpsed it, they have failed to maintain it and continue their devotion to it. And they try to bring that down to a very mundane type of existence. So they turn spirituality into a form of psychology, either without knowing that they're doing it, again, like if you fully know you're doing it, you wouldn't be doing it. So it's always some form of unconscious behavior to protect oneself, to boost one's own sense of feeling comfortable and accomplished within oneself, to feel like an expert in your field when people that you've been hanging around with for 20 years, going to certain teachers, studying certain books, and you share a certain language with, you got to con consistently innovate to stay at the top of your game. You got it. And it bastardizes true spirituality, true liberation, true freedom, true enlightenment, more and more and more until you've got this, this fake dry desert land of the mind. A desert is empty, but it's dry as fuck. <laughs> it's not like space. It's not like, mm. but it will act like space. It will appear as spacious and peaceful and content. And this is why I keep, I keep incur if anything, like if I die today, forget my teachings, remember this one thing. Because it's not about my words either. Remember this one thing. And that is never forsaken the seeking impulse, for it's the truest thing about you. And it's your lifeline amidst mm -hmm. these, this mist of man made contraptions and false teachings, mistaken ideologies. It's your lifeline to truth, it's your lifeline to true spirituality. You cannot reduce true spirituality to a form of psychology or investigation. You can't, it's impossible. You, all you'll do is you'll checkmate yourself in your own subtle mental body and you won't know you're doing it. And the mental body can absolutely pose as emptiness, as peaceful, as content, but it's a complete trap, complete trap. Uh, and it's painful to the soul. So you might feel more content and more content and more peaceful at a personal level. But I prefer an intense, eager, frustrated seeker that just wants to get to the bottom of things. And it's so frustrated that it's not there yet. And it just can't handle the things in its life. And it's willing to even bypass if it needs to, to get to true understanding. That's passion. That's the creator begging to know itself in the form of a human consciousness. Don't try to become peaceful. Continue to seek. That is your lifeline. Never stop seeking, no matter what any teacher tells you, that seeking is a trap, that there's nobody here to seek, that who is doing the seeking, who is doing the talking. Mm -hmm. Seek your fucking ass out <laughs> until you're dead, until you're either your ego is dead or your body has lost its lively disincarnation. But continue to seek. Of course, balance yourself, nourish yourself, don't go nuts, but <laughs> trust that seeking impulse more than anything, more than any teacher, more than any guru, more than any book, more than me. Trust the seeking impulse, because that's the creator whispering to you every single fucking second of your life. And if you try to intellectualize that and reduce that to some form of psychologically investigated emptiness, or you're fucked. Because you're in a trap. You're in a trap. And the creator loves you. And it hurts when it sees that in a way. So never stop seeking. It's my only recommendation. Forget everything I've ever said. Never mistrust the seeking impulse. 
balance the way that you apply that so that it's nourishing for you and it's sustainable for you. Don't go so crazy with frustration that every single moment is super, super painful. You got to balance it out. But try to not define it as painful. Try to define it as passion, a passion for the truth, a passion for the Creator knowing itself. And know that it's a journey for 99.999% of beings. It's a journey that takes consistency, that takes practice, that takes earnest seeking becoming more and more pure in your desire and your motivations, investigating more and more of yourself and yes, doing some shadow work, meaning simply look at where you're coming from, look at what your beliefs are, look at your false motivations that claim to want this, but really, it's just trying to get to that, and so forth and so on. Yes, know yourself on a psychological level as clearly as you can, it's absolutely beneficial and helpful for your balance and the sustainability of your search. But more important than any of that bullshit, is the seeking impulse itself, because that's literally what makes you exist. That's literally your existence. That's literally your life. That's literally the creator in the form of your expression. So trust that above anything else. Don't fall for the false messages. Amen. I feel like the idea of seeking has got a really bad rap. Why do you feel that people think seeking is a bad thing. So when the ego, which doesn't want to suffer, or so it believes, even though it perpetuates it, when the ego who doesn't want to be, let's say, uncomfortable, the ego loves to suffer, just doesn't like to be uncomfortable. <laughs> it loves to be right and suffer for the entirety of its life, <laughs> and be righteous about that suffering. It loves that. It loves drama. It loves suffering. It just doesn't like to be uncomfortable. It doesn't mm -hmm. like to face itself. It doesn't like to be wrong. It, it loves to suffer. It doesn't like to be wrong. Hmm. Anyway, so if, a, if the ego, if you will, hears them, is already kind of maybe um, tired of the journey. Maybe they haven't attained the enlightenment that they hoped they would, but perhaps weren't confident enough in to pursue all the way. Now, and therefore, they haven't really found the Creator. So they don't know what the true teachers have spoken about all these ages, the true scriptures, what they are pointing to. And but they start to after 5, 10, 20 years, they become so familiar with the language, they can become so familiar with the concepts that now it's so easy to live in a bubble that acts as if it's enlightened. But mm. you got to be honest with yourself. Do you know, infinity? Have you directly experienced infinity? Don't say no, it doesn't exist. Where is infinity? It's like, who would be experiencing infinity? Have you directly experienced infinite, absolute perfection beyond any comprehension, beyond the physical body, beyond the subtle bodies, beyond the causal body, even beyond the God state body of Satchitananda? Have, do you know the creator? Do you know yourself as the absolute infinite one creator? the source of all things. Oh, I'm just delusional. Oh, that's not really what they meant. It's just sort of symbolic speech. No, that's what they meant. That's what they meant. You can experience <laughs> directly what it's like to be the absolute one infinite creator beyond any appearance or illusion or content or emotion or thought. Have you? No, you've not. Of course not. Very, very few people have. And that's okay. That's the journey of an entire, that's why there's a whole cosmological system of densities of evolution, where gradually through the dimensions, as you ascend, your consciousness becomes more and more densely filled with the light of God. This takes billions of fucking years. Mm -hmm. Now, in this human <laughs> lifetime, we have this unique opportunity to awaken to this and to accelerate this because of the contrast, the veiled state that we're in, and the the catalyst that is available here and the confusion that's available here that can inspire deep, profound seeking for the Creator can help us accelerate that journey. What ego wants to do that? Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound appealing. So I read these teachings because I'm vain, I'm idle, like I'm seeking for some relief, for some comfort, I'm seeking for some peace of mind. Nothing wrong with that. If you're just seeking for some peace of mind, awesome. Those, those, Emptiness teachings of like, oh, yeah, there is not, this is not there, that's not there, that's just an image, that's just a thought, oh, I can relax. That's great, that's great, basic, standard spirituality. 
it'll give you peace of mind. But don't mistake it for spirituality. It's a, it's a psychological game to get to a state of contentment so that you can move on with your life. That's perfect, that you can live your relationships with greater integrity and greater clarity. Great, wonderful, nothing wrong with that. Just don't call it spirituality. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the spiritual search. Spiritual search is for diehards only. It is for those that have this passion and they cannot stop seeking until they find. So when an ego, most egos, hear the true teachings and the true teachers from the ages, the scriptures, they hear about enlightenment, they learn the language, they learn the concepts, but they don't practice. They don't seek hard enough. Uh, what was your question? Because I had an answer lined up. Why does seeking have such a bad rap? Nice. Why does seeking have such a bad rap? Okay. So now, what will the ego do? It will take one thing out of the million statements that these sages made. It will take one thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that suits my agenda. Mm -hmm. That suits, I just want to be enlightened without actually knowing the Creator and going through all that work and all that intensity of will and faith and sacrifice. I don't want to do that. I just want to be, I want to appear enlightened. I want to be the expert in my field. I want to know how to play with language and how to um, battle somebody else to the ground and be more enlightened than them. I want to be peaceful and boast my ego a little bit. So I take one statement from these sages, such as, you are not the doer, or such as, there is nobody here to get enlightened, or such as, the one who's asking the question doesn't exist. Those were given from the realization of the infinite one creator. Those are nuggets. The ego will take this, put it in its bubble of psychological language and concepts, and will take it as if it's a non-concept, as if it's enlightenment. It's got nothing to do with enlightenment. And now it will say, well, another such statement is, there is no need to seek or seeking is futile because it's already here. Beautiful nugget, if you understand where it comes from and you mm -hmm. have the dedication required to get it. But if you turn that into, even subtly, and it goes without notice for those egos, because the ego is full of self deceit, it now takes this into a conceptual framework. And it now starts teaching itself, seeking is a sign I'm not enlightened. Mm. So any urge to seek is just uh, me having an imbalanced idea. It's just a trauma trying mm. to release itself. It's just uh, me trying to get somewhere as an ego. It's a trap, total trap. So now you've completely turned against yourself and your own quest and you pause yourself. And so seeking gets a bad rep because seeking means ego, right? Mm -hmm. Only the ego seeks. Well, actually, it's the ego that's taking on that teaching because it doesn't want to do the work. And it doesn't know infinity. And it doesn't know that it doesn't know infinity because it will think about infinity or will think that it knows what God means. And ultimately, we'll even try to deconstruct those concepts as not, as just being more seeking, more concepts. Yet, oh, hmm. uh, I get nauseous. So, and there's many people like that. There's many people like that. Mm -hmm. There's many communities like that, that reinforce it. There's many teachers like that, that reinforce it. They're in a false state of non-doership. They're in a false state of there is no self. They're in a false state of emptiness. They're in a false state of deconstructing reality. And I, I really actually do want to warn for that because it is like suicide. It's like the suicide of your actual life force. And it's worse than even that not actual suicide, as we call suicide, because it's a trap of the most important thing in life, mm -hmm. which is your seeking impulse. That magnetic field, which is inherent, it's in every fucking subatomic particle of our being, is the creator wanting to know itself as a magnetic field. And we feel that as frustration with the world around us. We feel it as frustration with our thoughts and emotions and the chaos and our conditioning. We feel that as wanting to seek more, knowing that more must be possible, that seeking impulse is your lifeline to truth, my friends. So please, whatever you do, trust in that. Don't trust in human beings. Don't trust in teachers. Trust in that life force. And if you meet a teacher that's helpful for you at that time, perfect, use their material, but always stay true to the seeking impulse. If they're trying to diminish the seeking impulse, um, run away as hard as you can. <laughs> if they try to deconstruct enlightenment, 
They can deconstruct everything else about you, but if they try to deconstruct God and reality and the infinite as just being another image of the ego's imagination that it's seeking for and it shouldn't, run the fuck away as hard as you possibly can. <laughs> just like you would if someone tells you to commit suicide. You run away as hard as you can. Because it's essentially the same thing. So I hope I made my case. Mm -hmm. That's an example of a passionate wave that comes forth from the mirror mm -hmm. state. That's not personal. Like there's no trace in me. It just, if anything, it feels cleansing. It feels like this cleansing wave that just demolishes some kind of an illusion that's pervasive in society or in the subculture of spiritual seekers that go to sort of these neo-Advedic. And, and there's so many variations of it now that there's variations that don't call themselves neo-Advedic. They'll deconstruct neo-Advedic and then they're the better, oh my God. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's a crime against spiritual seekers. So as a student, how do you know? Uh, you might not always know, but by the way that you feel. True spirituality is always about greater freedom and greater love for others, but not in a conventional sense. It's about true care, true authenticity. But to keep it really simple, true spirituality, not psychologically reduced spirituality, which has nothing to do with spirituality. True spirituality emphasizes, ultimately, it may have other work to incorporate to balance the psychology. Okay, it may have some shadow work, it may have knowing your unconscious mind, and it coming to an acceptance of that and healing that that's all beautiful work, and it's required to form a solid foundation. But in the end, if the end game of that teaching is not total absolute freedom, it's a form of psychology, it's not spirituality. If you don't feel freer and freer, but you feel more and more right, a mm. sure sign you fall nice. into a trap. And a lot of these things, a lot of these teachings are subtly about being right. Wow. <laughs> but but people don't recognize that. So maybe now you do. Now you have this knowledge, um, this warning, if you will. True spirituality is about freedom. Psychologically reduced spirituality is typically about some version of being right, getting it right, by not being an ego, by not seeking, by deconstructing your search for the Creator, by deconstructing God and reality and arriving at some kind of sense of emptiness and contentment and peacefulness with whatever. But, True spirituality has absolutely nothing to do with main, mundane existence. Throw out the whole slogan of before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Because, yeah, you may be chopping wood and carrying water after enlightenment, but it's got, enlightenment's got nothing to, it is a completely transcendent state of consciousness. It's got nothing to do with mundane reality. Yeah, and sometimes you got to paint your house. Well, don't, don't make it right to like be so mundane because then you get you get people and teachers that will hmm. proliferate their ego not knowing that they're doing it not fully knowing that they're doing it because if you fully know you're doing it you wouldn't ever do it because your soul would cry out against your actions so it's a state of unawareness of subtle assumptions and ego self-deceiving strategies but um what was i going to say throughout the slogan <laughs> It's well, it's a transcendent state, ultimately, the ultimate aim is to become the creator once again. Okay. And, um, oh, yeah. So then there's also this whole trend, very similar to everything I've already shared, but I'll just also highlight this. And there's many more subcultural subcontextual things that will be idolized in different kinds of teachings and teachings, uh, teachers. So just be aware of this trap in general, just use what I've exemplified the examples I've given you, and be aware of anything along those lines that you're feeling. Doesn't mean you can't use some of the tools, but never deconstruct your seeking for the Creator and never deconstruct the Creator. Deconstruct everything else, every other idea you have about life by all means. But never let your seeking for the Absolute Infinite One Creator and your union with that true enlightenment, never let that be reduced to a psychological assumption that needs to be deconstructed, or some kind of trauma or personal need that you need to dissolve, otherwise you're imbalanced and you're not as right as the teacher or the teaching. But so then people will start to idolize, because they failed in their attempt to realize the Creator. And it sucks when you've been trying that for 10 years, and you've been in that community for 10 years, and you're still a fucking human person, that still gets triggered every day and still has their emotions and their traumas and you're not free. 
yeah, it can suck to your ego. <laughs> but then don't start chopping wood and carrying water and trying to make that new enlightenment. Don't try to live a humble life that is uh, catering to social norms and that's being really nice and kind and loving all the time. Don't live a mundane life and then claim that, that you're so pure in not needing anything else. That's another trap. It's like, oh, I'm just painting my house. Uh, therefore, I'm better than you. It's just a different way of expressing the same thing. True spirituality is about being absolutely free, including from yourself. If it's got anything remotely to do with being right, run away, run away. That's one way to recognize it externally. How to recognize it internally is use your guidance system. Use, like once you fall in love with your seeking impulse, which is the direct phone connection that you have, the direct communication line that you have from the creator to itself in the form of you. It's the most important thing in your life. Once you develop a clear conscious relationship and you surrender to that and you become devoted to that, nothing can fool you for longer than a few days or a few, few weeks where you're in some kind of a teaching trap or mind bubble, but you always get out of it. That's why I say it's your lifeline. Trust the seeking impulse. The clearer you are on the seeking impulse, the more devoted you are, the more you hold that as the only sacred thing in your life, the more easily you can recognize uh, people that are full of shit and teachings that are full of shit and teachers that are full of shit. Um, and you can see beyond the appearances. You can recognize where someone comes from, even though they call you an idiot, versus where someone comes from, even if they call you, uh, you're perfect as you are, and you're a beautiful flower, and you don't have to seek anymore. It's okay. You're, see beyond the appearances, only the seeking impulse. That is intelligence. To know the seeking impulse, to be devoted to the seeking impulse, is the source of all true intelligence, of all fierce intelligence, of all authenticity, because that's what will carry you through this fucking mist of man-made contraptions and mistaken teachings. So those are two things to look for. Look for freedom. Never give up. Never give up on freedom. Never settle for peace of mind. Never settle for contentment. Never settle for a psychologically reduced version of spirituality. Never settle for deconstructing the true seeking impulse, the creator, the magnificent mystery of all that is. Never, ever, ever settle for letting go of that. If it's about right, and it's about peace of mind in that way, psychologically reduced, if the aim becomes peace of mind, we've lost our mind. The aim should be freedom. The aim should be truth. The aim should be the creator knowing itself in its full, infinite, absolute glory. Unless it's not what you want. And then, then that's great. Like, no offense. If what you want is peace of mind, and you struggle all your life, and you don't, you don't want enlightenment, uh, but then don't call it enlightenment. And don't try to reduce enlightenment to your needs. Your needs are valid. If you need peace, if you need healing, if you need cuddling, nice. if you need cuddles, if you need love, if you need sweetness, if you need to heal these things, and that's your priority, and that's what would satisfy you, then you have absolutely have my blessing and not what I say has to apply to you. But if you're a spiritual seeker and you know that you are, and you want the truth, you have to fall in love with the struggle of trusting the seeking impulse, which goes against everything mankind has ever told you, including most, most, most of the spiritual teachers and teachings. Passion, the fire of your passion, if you are a spiritual seeker and you actually want enlightenment, then never extinguish that flame by no means. Good thing is you can never fully do it. You'll die, you'll review your life, and you'll be like, oh, fuck, I was kind of caught in that <laughs> trap. Let's go again. <laughs> so you can never lose that life force. You can only cover it up in this life. So don't worry too much about it, but you might as well use this life, no? If that's what you want. If enlightenment's what you're searching for, don't be fooled. Trust yourself. Trust yourself more than anyone. That deepest impulse. Don't trust your thoughts. Trust the seeking impulse. There's a source of all intelligence. And it's why I'm able to talk to you like this at the age of 32. It's the only reason. It's because I trusted the seeking impulse beyond any socially accepted means or any other teacher or whatever they said. I, and I fell for these traps too. That's how I can recognize them. That's how they're yucky to me now. That's how I can sense somebody from a mile away. And I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> here's that type of consciousness. Here's that type of trap. It's because I've been there. But at the end of the day, it never satisfied me. And I never fell for the trap 
uh, you should be satisfied or appear satisfied. That was never satisfying to me. Seek your fucking ass off until there's nothing left to seek. That'd be my advice. Mm. <laughs> but no trace, no trace left. Take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. So it feels like this was done as a session. Do you have any homework that you would suggest for people to take on for this session? If you resonated with this message and you feel it's important, um, share it. It'll be a nice uh, exercise. Boom. And never stop seeking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. If you love these teachings and you want full access to almost all of Bentinho's recorded material, go to bentinomassaro.tv. Right now, we're offering a free seven-day trial with unlimited access to everything on bentinomassaro.tv, including curated playlists, guided meditations, and much more. This is our number one recommendation for you. As a subscriber, you'll get first access to these podcast episodes two weeks before they go public. You'll also get access to exclusive Q&As with Bentinho and other content only available to subscribers of BentinhoMassaro.tv. Also, Bentinho recently created a free online global enlightenment retreat. It's eight long-form sessions that coherently guide you through the foundation of his enlightenment teachings. You can watch the free online global enlightenment retreat at BentinhoMassaro.tv or on YouTube. If you're interested in the most current and complete overview of Bentinho's work to date, this is where we recommend you start. Another great resource is Trinfinity Academy, Bentinho's free online school for enlightenment, empowerment, and infinity. Each class is concise and clear and distills one key topic at a time, including homework. We strongly recommend you check out Trinfinity Academy if you want to master the mechanics of Bentinho's teachings. Finally, don't underestimate the value of sharing this episode with the people who came to mind as you were watching or listening. It's a service to them and the collective, and it's also the best thing you can do to support us in getting this message far and wide. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and leave positive reviews and ratings on your preferred platforms, and follow Bentinho on social media, especially Instagram. Thank you 